Good morning, sixth grade. It's Wednesday morning, and we're going to get started on our day today. I wanted to have a devotion this morning before we got started, and I tried to do history outside yesterday, but my neighbor decided to start mowing his lawn, so all you could hear on my video was the roar of the lawnmower. So um, it's pretty quiet this morning, though. The birds are singing, which is beautiful. The weather is nice. We might get some rain today. I don't know. Um, looking a little cloudy, but it feels really good out here. But before we get going, let's go ahead and have a devotion together. And yesterday I talked a little bit about Easter. Today I'm going to kind of veer away from that. Um, the scripture that I want to go over today, or kind of give you an example of, if you have your Bibles out, let's go ahead and open those to Psalms 56, verses 3 through 4. I'll give you a minute to get that. Psalms 56, 3 to 4. And again, I don't think I'm reading out of the King James Bible. I'm on my iPad right now. I have my King James Bible out, but it's on a different part. All right, if you're ready, I want to read that uh, verse for you. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? And that's Psalms 56, 3, 4. And I want to talk to you about a man who, he was a mighty man of God, but honestly, he was a little bit afraid. And his name was Gideon. You can find Gideon's story in the book of Judges if you want to go to that at any time today and read that. Um, the section of Gideon's story that I'm going to talk about is in Judges 7, verses 9 through 10, and verses 15 through 22. Um, Gideon was the captain of a mighty army of the Israelite army and the Lord had given him a couple of dreams of how to um, lead the attack of the next country that they were going to be at war with which was called the Midianites and um, Gideon felt like his dreams were kind of silly dreams but yet he um, wanted to trust in God and know that they came from God and in these dreams the Lord ended up telling him to reduce his huge, huge, huge army down to only 300 men. And the Midianites had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men in their army. And Gideon, Gideon was thinking, 300 men, Lord. But he did as he was told. And um, the Lord, I want to read a little bit of notes that I had made. The Lord had told Gideon to send most of the men back um, home from the Israelite army. And he was left with only 300 men. That night, the Lord told Gideon to get up and attack the Midianite camp. Then he said to Gideon, if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant and just listen to some of the things. Sneak in and listen to some of the things that the enemy army is saying. So Gideon and his servant went down to the edge of the camp and they heard a man telling someone else about a dream that he had had. He said, I dreamt that a loaf of barley bread rolled into our camp and flattened a tent. Now that sounds like a silly dream. A loaf of bread rolls into the camp and flattens a tent. The other person laughingly replied, it is the sword of an Israelite, of Gideon. In other words, he was saying, Gideon's going to attack us and flatten our tent. Ha ha ha, with the loaf of bread. When Gideon heard about the man's dream and what the other person he sa had said, he worshiped and praised God because he knew this was God's answer that yes, even with only three men, even with only this silly loaf of bread in the dream, God was going to be victorious. Does it mean being afraid? If, if we feel afraid, does that mean that we don't trust God? God made us. I love this part of this devotion. God made us with a natural fear that keeps us from doing dangerous things and taking unnecessary risks. If we were scared of nothing at all, we would walk across a road without looking both ways. We would touch a stove and burn our hand if we had no fear. We would jump off of buildings, and if we were at the zoo, we might jump in the crocodile pit because we had no fear. But that also is no wisdom as well. So fear is good, but only good when it keeps us from doing harm to ourselves. Fear is not good when it keeps us from enjoying our life. And when it keeps us from being the best person that we can be. If fear is holding us back, that's when it's not good. And most of all, when it keeps us from doing what God has planned for us. 
the Lord called Gideon to be a brave man, even though he was afraid. And we read that in Judges 6, 12. And I'm just going to read that real quick. You don't have to um, turn to it. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So yes, he was afraid, but the Lord was still with him. And even though he was afraid, he was still a very mighty man. Being brave is when we trust God enough to step out in faith and obey him, even when our fears tell us that the situation might not come out good, we still step out trusting in God and he turns it all for good. So verse four today, one more time, Psalms 56, three to four, when I am afraid, I will trust in you in God whose word I praise in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? So just a quick thought. It's okay to be fearful as long as our trust is still in God. And as long as our fear does not hold us back from the things that God has for us. So we're going to begin our day today and we are going to do our best, but we're not going to get stressed out, right? Sister Preston saying, saying, ah, Sister Preston is staying stressed out. So I'm preaching to myself as I'm preaching to you. But so um, again, do our best with no stress. And we will be going to math, of course. And I'm going to go downstairs and begin math with you. So I will see you in the dungeon of the basement. I love everybody. Have a good day. See you in a few minutes. All right, we are headed into math. Uh, maybe tomorrow I'm going to try to do some speedy Sam's, see how you do on them without me. And um, so we'll get those going tomorrow, hopefully. I wish I could throw candy to my winners, but I can't because we're not together. But first thing this morning that you're going to do is your speed drill. And you are doing lesson 105. Go ahead and get that out. Make sure you turn that in in your folder on Thursday, which is tomorrow for you. Lesson 105. I'm getting there myself. Okay, equivalent fractions. Let's talk about those for a few minutes. We memorized those at the beginning of the year. If you didn't memorize the, them, I begged you to memorize them because <laughs> they are so important. So um, one half, let's do this real quick on my circles that I already have drawn. Just for review, because I know we haven't, haven't done this in a while. One half. Everybody should know this one. It's the easiest one that there is. What is the decimal for one half? It is 0.5. If you have half of a candy bar, you have 0.5 or 5 tenths of a candy bar. Now, however, my directions say to change it to my equivalent percent. So I'm going to move this. Percent means hundredths. There's two zeros in one hundred, so that means I'm going to move it two times towards my invisible percent sign. Moving it one, two, filling my, uh, filling my dip in with what, everybody? I hope you're all saying a zero and adding my percent sign. So the, the percent equivalent for one half equals, let's write it a little bit neater, more neatly, 50%. So. Don't just come up with your decimal, but also change it to a percent. Now, um, a couple of these are going to get a little bit tricky. All I'm asking is that you do your best. I think you're going to do well with all of these, though. Go ahead and do that speed drill, and I will grade that when you turn your work in this week. If you need to pause me while you do that, that is fine. I'm going to go ahead and get started on our lesson today. What's really nice about our lesson today is we are not learning anything new. We are still measuring angles. I want to give you a, a little bit more practice on this. So we're actually skipping pages 225 to 226. If we were together in class, we would not be skipping this lesson because I feel it's an important one. And I love it because it's a challenging one. Um, and it, it digs in that brain of yours and works it all out. So, um, But we're not going to do that because I'm not with you and I want to be with you for that lesson. So we're going to go over to our circle review on page 227. 
And I want you to do, I'm going to do number one and number two with you, but I do want it on your notebook paper. I want to see your circle drawn. I want to see how you're doing with measuring angles. So yes, um, get out a piece of notebook paper, the top right hand corner, put math, page 227 and 228. Uh, when I was grading some of your work from last week, many of you are not putting your name on your papers. I understand that because you're putting them in your folders, but what I'm doing is I'm taking them out of your folders, putting all the math assignments together, all the reading assignments together so I can grade them all together. Make sure your name is on everything, just like if we were in class. All right, let's do number one together, but again, I do want it on your notebook paper, so if you're not turning notebook paper into me, I can't give you a grade for these assignments. So um, I'm gonna try to stay on YouTube every time I want something on notebook paper. I try to put it on the syllabus, but it's getting a little confused. So I'm gonna definitely tell you on YouTube. All right, back to our work. Number one class practice says, draw a circle with a diameter of three inches. So you're gonna need your compass out. Divide it into angles of 110 degrees, 75 degrees, and 175 degrees. So very important thing that you already know before you can draw a circle and mine is not going to be a diameter of three inches i just drew a big one on the board because i'm more interested in helping you get your angles in there we cannot draw a circle knowing our diameter what do we need to know to draw a circle we need to know our radius this one's very easy what is half of three inches if you don't know that, you can always divide three by two, but most of you are gonna know that half of three is 1.5 or one and one half. So you're gonna open your protractor to one and one half inch because that is our, should have put this right here, radius. You don't want to open to your diameter, you need to open to your radius. So go ahead and open it, one and one half inches. Your half mark will be a little bit longer between the one and the two, so that's where you'll want to open your compass to. Go ahead and on your notebook paper, make your circle open to one and one half. Next thing we're gonna do, you want to put a center to your circle for your vertex on your protractor. keep all my supplies over here on the ping pong table so I have to walk over to do that here's my protractor don't forget the first thing I'm going to look for is my vertex I'm gonna go ahead and make a radius with my straight edge I've written my angles down here you don't have to do that I just did it for myself so I don't have to look back at the book over and over I'm gonna make a radius I'm gonna make sure my radius doesn't go past my circle there so the first angle that it's telling me to make is 110 degrees. I'm gonna line my vertex up with my vertex. I hope you're all doing this with me. I want to see it on your notebook paper. I'm gonna follow my line out to my zero side or my 10 side, not my 180. I'm gonna follow my scale up to 110 and make a mark. We worked on this yesterday, so I hope this is easy for you today. Once I make my mark, I'm gonna connect my mark and my vertex. And this angle is 110 degrees. Hope everybody has that. Now I'm gonna move away from this radius and I'm gonna use this radius to make my 75 degree angle. So I'm gonna put my vertex on my center of my circle, follow my line out to my zero side. You're gonna get tired of hearing me say that, but I'm gonna say it over and over again. Follow my line out to my zero side, go round and round and round to 75. Now, be careful here I don't want the five mark between 60 and 70 because that's going to be 65. I want the halfway mark between 70 and 80. That is 75. I'm going to make a mark right there. Hope you can see that. And then I'm going to connect my 
vertex with my line to the end of my circle. And that is my 75 degree angle. Now, if you will remember from yesterday, I don't have to make this 175 degree angle. Why? It's already made for me because when I add 110, 100, I'm sorry, 110, 75, and 175, I get 360 degrees, which is the degrees of a circle. So therefore, this third angle is already done at 175. All right, that is that one for your um, notebook paper. Let's go on over to number two. I have already made a circle here, and you already have some lines on your circle. So I'm gonna kind of make them similar real quick. I wish I had already done that, just because I'm gonna not, I'm gonna hurry so they won't be exact. <coughs> Ooh, bless me. Didn't even cover that sneeze in this coronavirus. Shame on me. It's a good thing I'm down here by myself, talking to myself like I'm a lunatic. <laughs> Y'all already know that anyways, don't you? My neighbors were probably thinking I was really crazy out talking to myself on my porch today. It's a good thing some of my neighbors are my family. All right, here we go. Now I'm done blabbing. So I'm gonna turn my tripod slightly. So I'm a little more in the middle here. Okay, now what's a little bit different than what we've done before is our, our angles are named on this one. So let's go ahead and write those in. Our vertex is O, this one is C, this one is B, A, and D. Now on your paper, on your notebook paper, I need you to actually write angle A, O, B, angle C, O, D, angle B, O, C, and angle A, O, D, just like is on your notebook or on your math book so that I know that you know which angle is which. Angle AOB, I hope you can see this, kind of. Angle COD, you don't have to make this circle on your notebook paper, just these answers for me. You do need to make that circle on your notebook paper. And angle AOD. I'm gonna draw some blanks. So, I wanna take a minute here to explain to you how we're going to look for angle A, O, B. We're, this center, center O is always gonna be my middle one. So I'm gonna go to A, O, B. See that? A, O, B, A, O, B. So it doesn't matter which pro, uh, rich, ugh, sorry, start again, which radius that my protractor is on, it just has to be on one of these two radius, radii. So I'm gonna put it on line A to O. Vertex on vertex, follow my line out to my zero side, go up, up, up on my zero scale, and I am about at 110. That might not be exactly the same in your book because I did mine freehand. Oh, wow, that's totally not the same. So your answer is gonna be different because I did mine freehand. Ah. Wish I had done mine a little bit better than that. But this at least gives you an idea of how you're going to measure it. So next I'm gonna measure COD and as, I'm sorry, CO, yes, COD. And as I said, my answers will be different because mine is not the same as your circle. But I wanna show you how to measure these. So I'm gonna look, okay, which angle is angle COD? I'm starting at C, C, O, D. This is the angle I'm gonna measure. So I'm gonna choose one of these radii to put my protractor on. This is gonna be the easiest one, O to D. Vertex on vertex, follow out to the zero side. This time the zero side is on the outside of my protractor. Going up, 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 up until I meet. And my COD is 130 degrees. Yours will not be, yours will be a different answer. Next, I'm gonna to go to BOC. B-O-C. Going to measure this angle here, vertex on vertex. Follow my line out to zero side or my 10 side if you don't have zero. 
up, 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 up till they meet. And my BOC is 75 degrees. Again, yours will not be because your circle is not, does not match mine. I want you to fill out all of these answers on your notebook paper. I will, those will be for a grade. I'm gonna give you a minute to do that. And I'm going to erase my board while you're working on those. If you haven't finished those already. Anytime you're confused, you can always go back and rewind me so you can hear me all over again. That's kind of nice compared to the classroom. Although if you're confused at the classroom, all you have to do is raise your hand. And that is what I miss. <laughs> all right, so hopefully you have that finished by now. We are not going to do number three. You can completely cross that out because that's the lesson from the previous page that we skipped. Going down to number four. Number four needs to be completely on your notebook paper. It should be easy peasy. It should all be on your formula sheet. All you'll have to do is get out your formula sheet and copy these formulas down. So on your notebook paper, all you'll need to put is 4A. And of course you'll have line, a line on your notebook paper and I'm gonna give you 4A. The formula for that is A equals one half times B times H. No problem there. I'll need to see that on your notebook paper on A through G. I'm going to go on over to page 228. Number five, on your notebook paper, I will need to see the answers to A, B, and D. You will be looking for three different answers in this chart. So I, that's what I will need to see for me to be able to grade this. I will, if they have given you the radius on A, then you need to give me the diameter, the circumference, and the area. You will use your formulas for this, other than on your radius and your diameter. However, I'm going to do C with you, just to give you an idea and a refresher of how to do the whole thing. So on C, my radius is... 17 yards radius diameter I'm gonna make a quick little chart here circumference and area and I need to see your work show me your work please show me your work so see so my radius is 17 yards I know that my radius is half of my diameter. So if I need my diameter, I need what this is all the way across. So all I will do is multiply my 17 times two. And that will give me 34 yards. This is C, you can fill these answers in on your book if you want to for C. Next is my circumference. I know that my formula for circumference is C equals pi times D. Therefore, I'm gonna plug in my numbers. C equals pi times my diameter of 34. I will go over here and multiply 3.14 times 34. I'm not gonna take time to do that because I have already done it. So my circumference, my answer for that is 1.2. It's not one point, one zero six point seven six yards. I'm gonna move my area over a little bit. Next, I'm looking for my area. That's really hard to see. Um, and for C, and for my area, ooh, it gets a little trickier. I need to show my formula again. Area equals pi times r squared. Plug in my numbers, pi is 3.14 times r squared. So I'm gonna go up to my radius. I'm not gonna multiply 17 times two. To square 17, I multiply it times itself. 
And once I do that, I know that that answer is 289. Next, I'm gonna go over and multiply 289 times 3.14. My worry here is always is that you're getting your decimal point in the correct place. And my answer for that is going to be 907.46. Now I'm working with yards here, so what do I want to put in my answer? I want to square those yards, my little two. And I hope you can see that up there. So a quick review on that chart right there. Also for circled work today, we are going down to number six and you are doing all of those. I mm, feel like I'm giving you guys too much work. Let's forget eight, A, B, and C today. So take that off of your syllabus. Take off number eight, A, B, and C. If you've already done that, if you went ahead and worked, then I will give you a little bit of extra credit. But I'm, I feel like I'm just, I don't wanna give you too much work. All right, on 6A, you are uh, multiplying your decimals. Make sure and put your decimal point there. On B, you need to look for a common denominator before you add. And on C, also a common denominator. C is a little tricky, let me talk to you about it. It's not tricky, we've done it before, but I just wanna give you a refresher. We have to borrow from our 14. So we're gonna change our whole number 14 to three and nine ninths. Now, why would I choose nine ninths? Because I need a common denominator and I already have a denominator of nine in my two and five ninths. And plus nine ninths equals one. So three plus one, I'm sorry, 13 plus one will give me my original 14. So that's where you're heading with that one. On D, don't forget to change your improper fraction, I'm sorry, <laughs> Ooh, your mixed number to an improper fraction before you multiply. And we are forgetting eight, A, B, and C. Cross that off your syllabus. That's enough work for today. I will see you in language. We are in language for Wednesday morning. Uh, hello, start again, sorry. We are in language, sixth grade, and we have been talking about pronouns. So today is going to be an easy day for you. It's just a very short review. I was supposed to give you a pronoun worksheet, which I did not put in your folder. I do, um, promise you next week is going to be better. I have come up with a better method to make sure I'm getting all of my worksheets to you. So I'm gonna work harder at being more organized and I apologize for that. So we are just going to do a very short form of this, this worksheet on notebook paper. Um, it's The worksheet was three sections. We are only going to do one section. I'm gonna do it orally with you. So get out a piece of notebook paper. At the top, label it language. And then underneath that, label it worksheet, page 43. I know it's not a worksheet, but that will just help me during my grading. Worksheet language, worksheet, page 43. And we are going to try our best at doing this orally. This first part is over verbs, which we've worked on for a long time. And I'm sorry my camera is dark. The, um, I believe it's getting ready to rain today, so it's getting darker and darker in my basement. I've tried to turn on more lights, but it's not working. Um, but I'm going to read a sentence to you. You can number this part, one, two, three, four, one through five. I'm gonna read a sentence. I'm going to give you two verb choices. All you have to write on the line is the correct verb. I'm gonna say that one more time. All you have to write on the line is the correct verb. You do not have to rewrite your sentence. Number one, both of my sisters has or have brown hair. So you will choose has or have. You want your verb to match the number of your subject in this. 
So here we have both of my sisters, which will be two or definitely more than one. So you're going to want to choose a plural verb. I'm gonna read that one one more time. Number one, both of my sisters have or has brown hair. Number two, none of my family members look or looks like me. None of my family members look or looks like me. Which verb would be correct there for verb agreement? Number three, most of the money is or are from my allowance. Most of the money is or are from my allowance. Number nine, several of the jars was or were broken when we got home. Several of the jars was or were broken when we got home. Number five, neither of the jars was or were. My camera died just a second ago and cut me off. So I'm going to go back um, to number 10 real quick. I know I had it on that last video, but I'm gonna repeat it one more time. Neither of the jars was or were broken when we left home. Neither of the jars was or were broken when we left home. And I'm moving to the next section. Go ahead and number again, one through five. This is a little bit different. We're talking about pronouns here. The directions say to circle all of the pronouns in the following selection. You will have personal, indefinite, interrogative, and demonstrative pronouns to circle. Um, you do not have to label them. You just have, I'm sorry, you're not even gonna circle them. You're just gonna write them on the line. You can go back in your book at any time and look up pronouns if you have a question. You are welcome to do that anytime in distance learning. In fact, I recommend doing that. Going back and looking in your book is great review for you. Number one is going to have two pronouns. Each of the boys came to tell him about the secret hiding place. Each of the boys came to tell him about the secret hiding place. I'm gonna give you the answer to this one. It has two pronouns. So on your line, next to number one, you want to write the pronoun each, and you want to write him. You do not need to rewrite the sentence, only the pronouns. Number two, again, two pronouns in this answer. It is over there, they whispered. It is over there, they whispered. Write your two pronouns on the line, please. Number 13, this one has three pronouns in this answer. Which of the bushes is it behind, he asked. Which of the bushes is it behind, he asked. Number 14, again, three pronouns in this answer. It is behind those bushes with the red berries. Do you see it now? Again, it is behind those bushes with the red berries. Do you see it now? And the last one has four pronouns. I see it. This is the perfect spot. Nobody will ever guess. I see it. This is the perfect spot. Nobody will ever guess. Now, if you did not get all those, you're welcome to go back and rewatch this and listen to those again. Look up some of those words in your pronoun section and your pronoun, un pronoun unit in your book. Let your book be a tool to you. Um, on the back of this notebook paper, when you're finished with that, I want you to turn it over and, and, you, and you will see on your syllabus, on the back of the worksheet, which I did not give, so use the notebook paper, name a Bible character for each letter of your first and last name. And yes, you can use your Bible to look this up. And so I have written my first and last name on the board. And I did this last night. So is, are all my letters? Yes, they're all showing. I did this last night, so I have mine all done. I just wanted to give you an example. So I'm gonna put mine up really quickly. This is just a little fun activity. Keep our creative juices flowing. L is for Levi. 
and this is Latresa, of course, that's my first name. For those of you that only know me as Sister Preston, I have a first name. Can you believe it? <laughs> Adam for my A. T is Timothy. R is Rahab. I, I chose Isaiah, and that does not look like the correct spelling. S is Simon. Actually, his full name, well, his first name was Simon Peter. And my last A, I had to ask Brother Preston for help with because I couldn't think of another one, which is weird because it's an easy letter, is Aaron. And P for Preston, I chose Paul. R, Rachel, E, one of my very favorite Bible characters, Esther. I'll put a heart by her name. S, Samuel. Another S was Samson. O, Obadiah. And N, was Naomi, which is another one of my favorite Bible characters. She pulled through during difficult times. So just a little fun creative activity. Go ahead and put that on the back of your notebook paper. And we will be moving into, I believe, how to eat fried worms next. So we need to read another chapter on that. We're getting closer to the end of the book. I think he's about halfway through his 15 worms. So um, find a comfortable spot to listen and we will do that next. How to Eat Fried Worms, we're picking up at chapter 20, and this is all about Billy's mother. The glare is so bad on my glasses from these windows. Billy slumped at the kitchen table and on one elbow, pawing in his bowl of Wheaties with his spoon. His mother was washing the breakfast dishes at the sink. But why isn't it good to eat hot dogs for breakfast? I know nobody does, but why don't they? Oh, Billy, said his mother, stop it and finish your cereal. Well, but a knock on the screen door. Billy's mother glanced around. Oh, hello, Alan and Joe. Is your sister better, Joe? Yes, thank you. Billy can't come out until he's finished his breakfast. Would you like to wait for him on the front porch? We came to see you, Mrs. Forrester. Oh, well, come in. Mrs. Forrester said Joe as Alan shut the door carefully behind him. I don't know if you know it already, but you see, about a week ago, Alan made this bet with Billy about eating worms. If Billy could eat 15 worms, one each day for 15 days, then, Billy, you're not still eating worms, are you? Billy stuffed a spoonful of Wheaties into his mouth. Not just worms, Mom. I've been eating lots of other stuff too. Look at me, I'm healthy. Dr. McGrath told you the worms wouldn't hurt me. But Billy, Dr. McGrath didn't think you were going to keep on eating worms. Joe nudged Alan and grinned. Aw, Mom, if five worms wouldn't hurt me, a few more won't either. They're little worms. Besides, it's a bet and I, they are big worms, Mrs. Forrester, said Joe, looking virtuous. We won't lie to you. My mother told me never to tell a lie. Manure, said Billy. <laughs> oh dear. Mom, it's a bet. I told you, if I win, Alan's got to pay me $50. $50, young man. Don't you move from that chair. She went off into the front hall. Thanks, whispered Billy, but you'll see it won't work. Alan and Joe gazed at the ceiling. Billy's mother's voice came from the front hall. Dr. McGrath, I'm awfully sorry to bother you again. It's such a ridiculous matter, but since I spoke to you, Billy has continued to eat worms. Pause. No, no, it's nothing like that. He's acting perfectly normal otherwise. It seems he's made a bet with some other boys. Pause again. One every day. He has to eat 15 to win this bet. Pause. Oh, thank you, Dr. McGrath. I'm so sorry to bother. She returned to the kitchen. But no more bets after this one, Billy. Alan and Joe, don't you egg him on anymore. He's far too eager to do wild things. 
Billy laughed silently at Joe and Alan. Alan made a rude gesture to him. Mrs. Forster said, Joe, what we really came about is that Alan and me are going up to Lake Lauderdale today with my father to fish, and we won't be back until tomorrow night. So we wondered if you'd make sure Billy eats the worms today and tomorrow. It's not that we don't trust Billy, Mrs. Forrester. No, said Billy's mother, smiling. But it's always better if there is a referee. You know, like Mrs. Sir Simmons said at school, to save arguments and hard feelings. We brought you the two worms. He held up a paper bag. We boiled them already, so you can just keep them in the refrigerator. Well, said Billy's mother, that is quite a responsibility. Are you sure I'll be neutral enough? I am his mother. Yeah, we thought of that, said Joe, but we figured, well, you're usually pretty fair. And besides, parents almost never cheat kids if it's just something between kids. They're usually pretty fair until they get into it. Hmm. Billy's mother laughed. And how does he eat them? Just cold boiled? Well, we've been frying them, Mrs. Forrester. He rolled, we rolled them in cornmeal and then fry them like a fish, but he can do whatever he wants, except that Alan and me have decided it's not fair to make soup out of them or chop them, all, chop them all up like hash or a chicken salad sandwich. He's got to eat them piece by piece. Who said, yelled Billy, when was that ever in the rules? We said, shouted Alan. Billy jumped up, kicking his chair over. Well, then I win because it's cheating to make up new rules in the middle. Oh yeah, shouted Alan. Then you lose because anybody knows it'd be cheating to hash it up. You think you're going to weasel out of it after I've already eaten nine? Who's we weaseling? You're cheating. Boys, boys, Billy, Alan. Silence. Please, now Billy, I think, no, let me speak first. I do think Alan and Joe are right. It wouldn't be fair to cut the worm all up. You can just think of some other way of fixing it. Thank you, Joe. She took the paper bag and looked inside. Phew, Billy, are you sure? Mom, you've eaten eels. You ate eel last summer in Long Island. These are just smaller. They're the same thing. Well, she put the paper bag in the refrigerator. I guess if Dr. McGarth says it's all right. Now, why don't we all go outside? I wouldn't go across the street with those folks, said Billy. Yeah, shouted Alan. Well, who'd want to go anywhere with you either? Yeah, shouted Billy. Boys, cried Mrs. Forrester. Stop it. All right, Alan and Joe, you had better go. The screen door banged behind them. Joe's face appeared in the screen. Thanks for saying you'll help out, Mrs. Forrester. And here we are at the 10th worm, chapter 21. What's for dinner, said Billy's father, coming into the kitchen. Well, said Billy's mother, you and I and Emily are having hamburgers and string beans and mashed potatoes. Billy is having a fried worm. More worms? The bet is still on? Look, she took a small plate covered with Billy's saran wrap out of the refrigerator. And you've eaten nine of these already, Billy? He poked the worm curiously. What do you do? Use a lot of ketchup and mustard? Billy nodded, and horseradish and other things, and we fry them. Billy's father looked at a corner of the saran wrap and smelled the worms. Helen, you ought to be able to do better than fried. Use your cookbooks. I'm not the cook. I'm just the referee. Oh, come on. Think of the challenge. He took a cookbook from the shelf under the spice rack. Let's see. Mustering the art of French cooking. He leafed through the cookbook. Here, how about poached eels on toast? No, said Billy's mother. It calls for chopping up the eel in little pieces, and that would be against the rules. How about spaghetti with worm balls, then? A savory worm pie. Creamed worms on toast. Spanish worms. Worm loaf with mushroom sauce. Wait, said Billy's mother, putting down her cooking apron. It might just... She took the cookbook and turned the index. Here, she said. Um, dredge the worm with seasoned flour. Saute in three tablespoons of drippings until brown. Covered with sliced onions. Pour over one cup of thick sour cream. Cover pot closely and bake in a slow oven until tender. Bravo, said Billy's father. Put the hamburgers back in the refrigerator. We'll all have worms tonight. 
I won't, said Emmeline. I wouldn't either. Ha, said Billy, grinning at the midst of chewing. Boy, Alan and Joe thought they were doing me in when they came to you, Mom. But this is better than steak. It tastes really good. Ugh, uttered Emily, making a face. Let me have a taste, said Billy's father. No, no, said his mother. Billy has to eat every bite himself. Alan and Joe were firm about that. And I'm the referee. Boy, said Billy, I don't mind if it tastes like this. The Eleventh Worm, Chapter 22, and this is the last chapter that, oh, let's see. I'll read two more chapters because they're only one page long. How'd you do it, said Billy. What's it called? My word, said his father. Tom gasped. Oh, Mrs. Forrester. On a silver dish in front of Billy lay an ice cream cake bathed in fruit syrups, peach, cherry, candied orange, topped with whipped cream, sprinkled with jelly beans, and smothered in almonds. It's called a whiz-bang worm delight, said Billy's mother proudly. I made it up. Is the worm really in there, said Billy, poking about with his spoon, and then scraping a bit of whipped cream at one end, he glimpsed the worm's snout protruding out from the center of the cake. Snug as a bug in a rug, said his mother. I still wouldn't eat a worm, said Emily, eyeing the whiz-bang worm delight with envious distaste. Now there's two words for you that don't normally go together. I would, said Tom, at least maybe I would. Chapter 23. Admiral Nagumo on the bridge of Akiago, December 6, 1941. That's quite a title right there. It won't work. Look, said Joe, even if he remembers the worms while we're at Shea, he can't get one. Where's anyone going to find a worm at Shea Stadium? Don't worry, we'll say you've won. We'll find a worm after we get home. And we keep right on stuffing him. Peanuts, hot dogs, hamburgers, Cracker, Jack, cracker Jacks, ice cream, orange soda, gum, Mars bars. You know how he loves to eat. You've, you ever seen him refuse something to eat? By the time we start home, he'll be so bloated, so drowsy and burping. Remember the last time when his father took us? He was asleep by the time we hit the parking lot. Your father will carry him in from the car and your mother and father and his mother and father will put him to bed. Next morning, he'll wake up and too late. You've won 15 worms in 15 days. He missed a day if we plan this trip. Alan gnawed on his thumbnail. What about Tom? We'll ask him along and then just not pick him up. <laughs> These boys, I tell you. We can tell your father and Billy that Tom's mother called. He was sick, his grandmother died, anything, just so we don't have to bring him with us. Alan sighed. It'll probably cost me $8 just to buy all that food. Cracker Jacks, hamburgers, yeah, but it'll cost you $50 if he wins. Oh, how did I ever get into this mess if my father ever finds out? Alan slumped on the front porch, gazing down at his sneakers and gnawing his thumbnail. Come on, said Joe, slapping him on the shoulder. Cheer up. You haven't lost yet. Go ask your father. And we're going to stop right there. We're stopping on chapter 24, the 12th worm, and we will pick up there tomorrow. And I believe we're going into health next. We are moving into health. Yesterday we talked about some very ugly, ugly, ugly snakes. Um, the coral snake, colored red and yellow with black bands. Uh, the king snake, scarlet king snake. Um, those are two very similar things and they are, they're asking you in your health book to know the differences of those two. Also the pit viper and the rattlesnake and the copperhead and the water mat moccasin and they all give me shivers. Ooh, I don't like them. Uh, today we're moving on to environmental safety which is pre and, and being prepared for that. That's our key. Just to be prepared. We cannot control the weather. We all know that. That is completely out of our hands but being prepared is not out of our hands. Page 23 is where we're starting today. I'm going to give you some highlights. You are also supposed to do a worksheet that I forgot to send, so we're going to do that together in a few minutes. Um, I want to pick up and I want to read with you today a little bit. I don't know if I'll read everything. I might. We'll see. Um, no matter where you live in the world, your area may be subjected to some kind of a natural disaster. 
Whether it be a hurricane, a blizzard, a tornado, or a thunderstorm, your safety may be threatened. Although you cannot control the damage done by these storms, you can help protect yourself and members of your family from harm by following these basic guidelines for safety. And it's so much better nowadays than when I was a little girl. When I was a little girl, um, for one thing, television was invented, so don't get crazy and think I'm that old, but I did not have a television because our church recommended that we not have one. So um, for any of you that have parents that were once UPC, your parents probably didn't have one either. But anyways, that's a whole nother subject for a whole nother day. But um, so we didn't really have any alerts coming. We didn't have a cell phone to give us a weather alert. So we basically had to watch the skies and kind of keep, um, keep our eyes on the sky. But um, nowadays we start getting weather alerts sometimes when the sun is out before a rainstorm or a thunderstorm even comes through. And we can click on the TV and they will tell us we can get on our phones, on our computers. And the meteorologists have so much updated information that we know those storms are coming in and that we know how to prepare. Thunderstorms, dynamite in the sky. A thunderstorm or electrical storm is simply a rainstorm with severe lightning. Highlight this next sentence. More people are killed each year by lightning than by hurricanes or tornadoes, largely because they do not feel as threatened by lightning. They're not as scared of it as we should be. And not fear, kind of like in my devotion this morning, not fear of what it can do to us, but we need to be more of an awe of it to know to be careful. Maybe that's a good way to say that. Stop highlighting there. It has been falsely said that lightning never st strikes in the same place, ugh, place twice. Yes, it does. That is, not, that is a myth, it's not a true statement. In a one year period alone, the Empire State Building in New York City has recorded to have been struck by lightning 48 times. So right there, if you watch Mythbusters, um, right there that claims that that is a busted myth. This can be attributed to the fact that, and highlight the rest of this paragraph, Lightning is attracted to the highest object in an area, such as a building, a tree, or even a person or animal if one is standing out on flat ground in an unprotected area. If you're on flat ground and you're the only thing standing, that lightning is gonna be attracted to you. Seeking shelter. Lightning is attracted to raised objects and metal is a good conductor of electric current. Therefore, it is dangerous to carry an umbrella in a thunderstorm. As soon as you hear the rumble of thunder and see dark clouds forming, you should find a place of shelter. You should also stay away from metal objects, such as fishing rods. Lucas, if it's thundering, stop fishing. Thundering and lightning, bicycles, wire fences, and railroad tracks. Because water is another good conductor of electricity, you should leave the area immediately if you are in or anywhere near water. If lightning strikes near water, the electric charge is powerful enough to harm anyone in that bottle of body of water. And the, hopefully nobody's in a bottle of water. Oh boy, y'all know when I talk fast, things just get messed up. But, so Caitlin Hannah, I know she swims in the summer because her Aunt Gina has a swimming pool. So if it starts thundering and lightning while you are in that swimming pool, Caitlin Hannah, you get your little brothers out of there and get in the house. There's a safety tip down here. Stay away from water during a thunderstorm. Electric current can travel through water just as it does through wires. Next page, safety tip at the top. This is a good one. Never get under a tree for protection during a thunderstorm. We automatically want to get under a tree, I think, if we're outside because the leaves and the branches feel like it protects us. But remember what I said, on a flat area, lightning is gonna strike whatever's sticking up the tallest. So if your tree is up, there's a tall tree, it could get struck first. When seeking shelter during a thunderstorm, try to get inside of a building or in a car. If there's no building or if there's no car nearby, you can still be safe if you remain calm Calm, 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 it's one of my favorite words. And remember some important safety rules. Stay away from high ground and tall objects. Even if you are not struck by lightning yourself, you can be shocked or electrocuted by the charge running through the ground. If you are on flat open ground, you should, 
Here's the rule, drop to your knees and bend forward, curling up into a ball. Your main objective is to avoid being the tallest object around. You don't wanna be the tallest, get down. Electrical invasion. If you are inside a building during a thunderstorm, you should stay away from windows and unplug electrical items, such as your phone. You don't want it charging during an electrical storm. If possible, avoid using anything electrical during a thunderstorm. If you feel your skin starting to tingle or your hair starts standing on end, lightning might be about to strike you. Quickly crouch down and curl up. Your parents probably have a flashlight to use in case of a power failure. You should know where the flashlight and fresh batteries are kept so you will be able to find them during a storm. If you have above ground telephone cable, those cables, those could be struck as well. Therefore, you should avoid using a corded telephone during a storm. So make sure we don't have any corded phones in our homes anymore, um, but make sure yours is not plugged in charging at the time. Live wire avoidance. After a storm, stay away from wires or cables that have been blown down. There could be live wires, which are carrying electric current. Um, contact between a live wire and a house or tree could definitely start a fire in just a matter of minutes. It could also shock you. Any power line that is blown down or knocked over should be reported as soon as possible. Often you'll see the power lines that have fallen down on the news, those have been reported. Um, you don't want to ever, once you get your driver's license, drive over a wire. Stay away from them if they've fallen down. Hurricanes are whirling cyclones of the sea. A hurricane is a natural disaster that you can usually prepare for in advance. Summer is a big hurricane, hurricane time. We often hear about them on the news um, in the Gulf, um, Florida, any of those areas. If you live in an area subjected to hurricanes, we don't. We live in a very landlocked area here in East Tennessee. Keep up with daily weather reports. I'm going to skim down through this a little bit. Since a hurricane can cause extensive damage, it is important to be prepared at all times for power outage, outages or emergencies that could last for several days. You want to have batteries at home. You want to have um, plenty of flashlights. You need to stay informed with news areas. Um, I'm in the next column on the next page. If your town is a project in the projected path of such a storm, you might be ad advised to evacuate. And that has happened many times in the United States. Um, one has been known to come towards land and they try to evacuate as many people out of that area as possible. If you are on vacation sometime and that happens, I recommend you evacuate. Tornadoes, twisting towers of destruction. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, tornadoes. I do unfortunately know quite a bit about them. I used to live in Jackson, Tennessee before we moved to Maryville, Tennessee. Brother Press and I married and moved to his hometown of Jackson, Tennessee. And it is called Tornado Alley because they have so many tornadoes that come right through that area. And we certainly experienced several while I was living there. Um, we do not have many tornadoes in our area. We have had a few and we do have some high winds, but we're protected by the mountains that are around us. So when those winds up in the atmosphere start to shift, and they get down close enough to our mountains. Our mountains are tall enough and high enough where they mess up the crosswinds. So we don't have them very often. So those mountains are great to, not only are they beautiful, but they're our protection as well. But um, in West Tennessee, there are not any mountains. It's pretty flat over there, a little hilly, but not any mountains. And um, the very first tornado that I experienced when I moved south, I was actually not even home for. Um, Avery was about 18 months old, maybe, and I was actually up at my parents' home in when they lived in the Chicago, Illinois area. My dad was having surgery for cancer, and I went up to visit. I went up to stay with my parents during this time, and so Avery and I were up there. Um, Brother Preston called me, and he said, we're going to have some very bad storms here tonight, and um, he said, so be praying for us, so of course I was. But he went to church that Sunday night, and then during the, during the service is when the tornado hit. And he couldn't even get to our home that night because there was so much damage in our city. Um, 
I was worried about my little home because I loved it so much. It was our first home, but he finally um, got to it the next day. There were so many wires down, he couldn't get to it. He had to go stay with his parents that night. But very much damage in our city. A few people in our city lost their lives in that tornado. Another tornado that we had after both Avery and Riley um, were born, uh, Riley was about two, so Avery would have been close to um, six, Avery would have been close to six, and um, we had a terrible tornado come through Jackson, Tennessee. It was in May, and the storm started coming, and Brother Preston said, get the boys and get them we didn't have a basement at that home and he said get the boys get them in the bathtub so we all got down in one of the bathtubs that was the bathroom in the central part of our house you always want to kind of go to the middle part of your house and um so clark came running in um, and jumped in the bathtub with us and i had pillows and things in there to cover the boys uh, they were so they were very tiny at that time and we started to actually hear the tornado and they do say that it sounds like a train that is exactly what it sounds like it sounds like a train running over the top of your house and we were praying 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 for protection we were calling the name of Jesus very scary time um, asking the Lord to protect us and um, I think the scariest moment was when we heard shattering glass just go through our house and our windows literally um, because of the pressure and the and the air, our our windows just burst out of our of our home. Um, the, they broke, and I heard Brother Preston say, "There goes all the windows." And of course, our next fear was that our roof was getting ready to go. We did have a lot of roof damage, but thankfully, the Lord kept His hand upon us. We had, I believe, 18 people in our city die that night from the tornado. So it was a very horrific time. Thankfully. My little family, as well as my in-laws, were all safe and sound. Our house did receive extensive damage. Um, our windows were boarded up for several days because there were many, I don't want to say several days, several weeks, a um, couple of months, even because there, were so, there was so much damage to our city that all of the construction workers that were trying to help um, could only get to you at a certain amount of time. So I remember every day how hard it was for me um, with the windows boarded up because the sunshine wouldn't come through and I love sunshine but um, and actually just another quick memory I'll share and I'm taking up so much of your day by sharing memories and I'm sorry about that but you know how much I love to talk when it comes to lesson time but um, about four nights after that main tornado that um, happened we had a second tornado come and uh, it was really sad because Riley had, when he was a baby or a young boy even, he had severe, severe asthma. So um, we were having this tornado come through and Riley was having an asthma attack at the exact same time. So even though we're not supposed to have things electrical plugged into the wall, I had his breathing machine plugged into the wall in the bathtub while a tornado was coming and Riley was trying to take his um, breathing machine while this tornado is going overhead. It was just one of those hectic times in life that you never forget. But again, we were praying, asking for the Lord's mighty hand of protection and he certainly kept his hand upon us. But so that's my tornado stories. I'm sure you all have some, especially those of you that haven't always lived in the Smoky Mountain area. But um, let's go ahead and read page 25 and I'll try not to tell any more stories so we can get done with our day. I've already taken 15 minutes for help. Ah, here we go. Tornadoes, twisting towers of destruction. Each year, more than 1,000 tornadoes occur in the United States alone. Many of these twisters have the power to destroy entire towns. And we just had one um, two months ago, I believe, move through Nashville. And the destruction there was just heartbreaking. So many lives lost. Highlight this um, to the end of the paragraph with me. The greatest protection from tornadoes is found underground in areas where tornadoes are especially frequent. Many houses have underground basements. If you have a basement, the safest place for you to go during tor a tornado or a high wind storm is in your basement. Or if you have a, a room in your home that doesn't have any windows, you want to try to get to that room as well. Because of my story time that I talked um, through so much, 
I am gonna have you do the remainder of this reading on your own. Also, um, page 26, finish reading that up for me. Let me get your syllabus very quickly. I wanna take a look at, oh, I have it right here. Um, I do want you to do the quick checkup on page 26, but go ahead and just do that right there in your book today. Um, I hope you're all following along on this so that you know um, when I make changes to our syllabus. Just do that right there in your book. We do. I do want us to do the worksheet together that I did not send, um, page, um, pot, page five, and we're gonna do that on the board. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this video off because Miss Caitlin Coombs is sending me a message. So I wanna check her message and then we'll get back together in just a second and do that worksheet. All right, I answered that question for Miss Caitlin, and I want you to get out a clean sheet of notebook paper and number one through nine on your notebook paper. One through nine. In the top right hand corner, please put health worksheet page five for me. I'm going to read this worksheet aloud to you and um, on numbers one through six, you can choose from the answers that are here on the board. You will not use all of these answers. You will use all except for two. Um, I'm going to read these for you in case they're a little bit difficult to read. Coral snake, elliptic pupils, frostbite, hypothermia, pit, poison ivy, scarlet king snake, and tick. I'm going to read um, some of their definitions. Please, number one through six, first of all, all you have to write next to the number is your answer. Number one, occurs when the body temperature drops below normal. And yes, you can look back in your book for these answers. Number one, occurs when the body temperature drops below normal. Number two, the freezing of body temperature the freezing of body temperature. Number three, a bug that might decay, I'm sorry, start on that one again. A bug that may carry Lyme disease. A bug that may carry Lyme disease. Number four, the deep cavity on each side of a viper's snout between its eye and nostril. Number four, the deep cavity on each side of a viper's snout between its eye and nostril. Number five, what is this phrase um, talking about? Red on yellow, kill a fellow. Red on yellow, kill a fellow. And number six, what is this phrase talking about? Leaves of three, let it be. Leaves of three, let it be. Now, if you didn't get all of those, you can go back on the video and watch that. Numbers seven through nine are not on the board behind me. You're just going to fill in the blank. Ooh, I'm really close up to you now. Number seven through nine, let's go over those. Number seven, fill in the blank. More people are killed each year by blank than by hurricanes. And all you have to do is fill in the blank. You do not have to rewrite the sentence and I'll say it one more time. More people are killed by blank than by hurricanes. Number eight, get protection from an blank in a basement or a cellar. Read that one more time. Get protection from a blank in a basement or a cellar. And number nine, lightning is attracted to blank objects. Lightning is attracted to blank objects. Again, you can look these answers up in your book. And that is all of health for today. Um, thinking we will go into history next. So I will see you in history. 
All right, we are on our last two subjects of the day, and I do wanna do some history with you. So let's get your history books out next. Talking about World War I today, yesterday we uh, discussed the Titanic, and I hope some of you did some additional research on that on YouTube. And um, as I said yesterday, so many interesting things on there. Today we have a lot of highlights to do on history. So make sure you have something to highlight with, a marker or hopefully a highlighter. We're opening up to page 220, getting right into World War I, of um, how World War I begins. 12.3, there's a picture of the Archduke Ferdinand and his wife, very important people at the beginning of World War I. And I hope you're ready, follow along with me please. A civilization had progressed so far by 1900 that many people thought the world could only get better and better. Little did they realize that in Europe, the stage was being set for two of the greatest wars the world had ever known, World War I and World War II. Let's go ahead and highlight that World War I was 1914 to 1918, important dates that you need to know for upcoming quizzes and tests. These wars reminded Christians of Christ's words of prophecy and comfort. Let's read this scripture, Matthew 24, 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Both wars began with events that took place in Germany. The German people had for the most part rejected the Bible and embraced the teachings of modernist preachers who said that Jesus is not God, that the Bible is not always true, and that a person's conscience should only should be only his guide, should be his only guide. Goodness. <laughs> Without the true guide of the Bible, the Germans were in great danger of making unwise decisions. And that is exactly what happens when we are out of the word of God. Our decisions become very unwise. The world prepares for war. Highlight the first sentence with me. Kaiser Wilhelm II, the ruler of Germany in 1914, sought to control more land. So he was the ruler, but he wanted more. Britain had the greatest navy in the world, but the German ruler also wanted to get, gain control of the seas. With this in mind, he began to build up Germany's army and navy. Other countries started to become fearful of Germany's might and decided to form alliances against them. They wanted to form friendships but be against Germany. Highlight this. An alliance is a promise between two or more countries to fight together against their enemies if a time of war should come. Also highlight the next sentence. The countries that sided against Germany were called the Allied Powers, important. Or we, we usually call them the Allies. Those countries that sided with Germany were called the Central Powers. You need to highlight both of those first two sentences in that paragraph. The few countries that made, I'm sorry, the few countries that decided not to take any sides were called neutral nations. Highlight the words neutral nations. So there were some countries that said, and I don't agree with this side and I don't agree with this side. So we're just gonna say we're neutral in this situation. Next column, European countries were preparing themselves for war. The only thing they lacked was an excuse to begin a war. And the excuse came on June 28th, 1914. Highlight that, the excuse came June 28th, 1914. Highlight this name, Archduke Ferdinand. Stop highlighting there. Heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary was visiting the small country of Bosnia with his wife the control of Bos Bosnia was causing much ill will between Austria and Hungary and the small country of Serbia. A young man under the influence of a Serbian secret society decided to get even with Austria-Hungary. Highlight the next sentence. As the Archduke and his wife rode by in an open car, this youth shot them both to death. And that shot really did begin World War I. Austria-Hungary blamed everyone in Serbia for the assassination. Germany's rulers, eager for an excuse to begin war, told Austria-Hungary the, <laughs> Hungary, that they could count on Germany's help if it went to war against Serbia. 
Austria-Hungary soon declared war on tiny Serbia. Meanwhile, Russia told Serbia that the Russians would help Serbia. Austria-Hungary soon declared war on tiny Serbia. Meanwhile, Russia told Serbia that the Russians would help Serbia. This angered the Germans, who then declared war on Russia. Oh, goodness, everybody's going back and forth here. Because France had promised to help Russia, Germany declared war on France, too. And if you wonder how a world war starts, that's how right there. One by one, the countries of Europe declared war on one another. Soon, Great Britain declared war on Germany. One Englishman said, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Indeed, gloomy days lay ahead for all of Europe. Top of page 221. Woodrow Wilson was president of the United States at that time. Highlight that sentence. There's a picture there of Mr. Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson. Most Americans felt that the United States should stay out of the war with Europe. For the first three years of the war, President Wilson did keep our country neutral. We said we weren't going to take e either side. German U-boats. Germany's powerful army successfully defeated several countries. The Germans had to think of a different plan for defeating Great Britain. Because Great Britain is an island, she depended on ships to bring her food and supplies. Germany knew that if she could destroy Britain's ships, she could starve the British people into giving up. So think about that. It's an island. The ships had to bring over supplies. If the ships could not bring supplies, therefore the people didn't get any. With this plan in mind, the Germans used their new weapon of war, the U-boat, which is an underwater boat or submarine. Highlight that. Germans used their new weapon of war, the U-boat, which is an underwater boat or, as we know it, a submarine. The Germans used the U-boats to destroy any ships that could be carrying food or supplies to Great Britain. The United States continued to send ships to Great Britain. As a result, the Germans then began sinking American ships sailing in the waters around the British Isles. What do you think America is going to think about Germany sinking our ships? Not happy about that. The, the sinking of the Lusita Lusitania. In May 1915, a British passenger liner, the Lusitania, left New York on its way to England. As the ship neared England, a German U-boat fired a torpedo into the side of the Lusitania. The ship sank quickly. Over 1,000 men, women, and children lost their lives, including over 100 Americans. And America became angry. Although many called for war, the U.S. still remained neutral. Go ahead and highlight that entire paragraph on the sinking of the Lusitania. The United States enters World War I. After a time of calm, the German government announced that after February 1st, 1917, it would follow a policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. German submarines would sink without warning any ships that entered the British Isles. They weren't giving them a warning. If you're in the British Isles, we are sinking you. That was according to Germany. Americans were enraged at this threat. Why? Because it was threatening human lives. Then in March 1917, British agents discovered a German letter asking Mexico to enter the war on Germany's side. This letter was called the Zimmerman Note. Highlight that for me. A German letter asking Mexico to enter the war on the German side. This letter called the Zimmerman Note. And if they entered the war on Germany's side, they promised Mexico land from the states of New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona in return, excuse me, in return for help with the war. In other words, now think about this. Germany was promising part of the United States to Mexico if Germany won the war. Did Germany have any right to give our land to Mexico? Absolutely not. Although Mexico did not help Germany, you can imagine how angry America became because Germany was threatening to break up our United States of America. The German ruler would stop at nothing. 
Highlight the next sentence. If he won in Europe, he would go after America. Our country was being threatened. And when America gets threatened, what happens? We are ready to go to fight, to war for the safety of our people. In April 1917, the United States declared war on Germany. Highlight this sentence. President Wilson read a war message in which he said, the world must be made safe for democracy. Stop highlighting there. The United States then joined the Allies. So we were definitely against Germany. In France, the French cheered the American soldiers as French bands played the Star Spangled Banner. The coming of the American troops gave a new hope to the Allies of Europe. They were very thankful for our help. Thus the Germans met a brand new fresh army. The Germany army began to weaken with American help, the French and British began to defeat the Germans. Each day, both sides lost hundreds of men. But these men believed that their countries were worth dying for. The end of the Great War. This was a, um, this was a short chapter on World War I. Our country and the other countries suffered much more than what this chapter is covering. War is always a time of suffering. The end of the Great War. Let's highlight this entire paragraph. Finally, the Central Powers surrendered, surrendered and on November 11th, 1918, World War I came to an end. Today, November 11th, is celebrated as Veterans Day. You get a day off of school in um, memory of this day right here. And we honor on that day those who fought for our country in any war and all who have served in our nation's armed forces. So if you wonder why we celebrate Veterans Day on that particular date, November 11th, 1918, you have just found out why. And let's go over these questions very quickly together. I want to hear your answers from your home. So say them nice and loudly so I can hear. Number one, the unsinkable ocean liner that sank off the coast of Newfoundland in 1912 was the Titanic. I hope you said that. Number two, a binding agreement between two or more countries to help each other in time of war. We highlighted that today and we all know that that is an alliance. Number three, the group of countries that fought against Germany during World War I. What is the answer to that? The Allies. Next question, the group of countries that fought with Germany was called the Central Powers. And that third part, the countries that did not take sides were called neutral nations. They said we're not taking sides. And number four, the event that began World War I. It was an assassination of an Archduke. Do you remember his name? Archduke Ferdinand. And where was he from? I hope you're saying Austria-Hungary. And his wife was also um, assassinated that day by a man from Serbia. Number five, the name for German World War I submarines were called U-boats. They were under underwater boats and we call them submarines. Um, number six, let's talk about that for a minute. Why did the Zimmerman note enrage the United States? It enraged the United States because Germany was making, number one, a promise that they could not keep. They were telling Mexico, hey, if you join us and fight against them, we're going to give you some of their land. First of all, Americans not going to want anybody to come and take their land at all. They're not going let to that, let that happen. But Mexico did not help because the knowledge that Germany intended to conquer America was Mexico's deciding factor. We didn't really talk about that. And that actually brought America into World War I. Nobody's taken our land, right? Right. We're gonna move into reading, and reading is our last class of the day today. Um, for reading, you need to do your read and think. And I want you to read pages 66 through 69, I believe we're still on the story of Nate Saint. Let me double check that, opening, opening, opening. Yes, 66 through 69, we're still not gonna finish it today, but I'm gonna have you do on your own reading today. So get somewhere, get comfortable, lay on your bed, lay on your floor, 
sit on your front porch and finish reading, or not finish reading, but read some more of our story about Nate Saint. And we did not begin, oh, I'm sorry, going back, your health poster. Um, your health, po ho uh, health poster is due on Thursday when you turn in your packet of work. Um, there is information on Jupiter about what I'm requiring. You need to choose a safety rule and just show that to me on your poster. Uh, there's an example um, of ideas I would use if I was doing a poster. So I hope all of that will help you. Just use things from home. Please don't go to the store. The store is not a safe place for you to expect your family or your mom or your dad to go right now. And I don't expect them to. Just use things that you can find at home. Um, surely you have some markers, some crayons, some colored pencils, maybe some magazines you could cut pictures out, that sort of thing. And if you don't have magazines, that's fine too. Um, construction paper, stickers, whatever. Just be creative with whatever you can find. So that is due Thursday. And tomorrow morning we will start off um, with our devotion. Today we did not begin our day with prayer time, so let's end our day with prayer time today. Um, everybody pray aloud with me in your homes. Let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, I come before you today with a grateful heart, Lord, that you have kept your hand upon us. Lord, I thank you for all that you have been touching during this time. Those that have gotten the virus, Lord, I'm thankful for the praise reports that I'm seeing and that I'm hearing of them, of them improving, Lord. And I'm continuing to believe and trust that you are going to heal other friends and family members that have it as well. Lord, I ask for your hand of protection upon all of my sixth graders and their families. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus upon them today. I ask that they will take advantage of this time in their homes with their family, that they will all draw closer to one another. Lord, I pray that you will help us on our work. Lord, help me to relay each and every day the things that I need to relay to my students. Lord, I thank you for this Easter service that we're getting ready to celebrate on Sunday. I thank you for what it means. I thank you for Calvary. Lord, if my sixth graders had been the only ones on earth, Lord, you would have gone to a cross just for their sins. And I thank you for that. Lord, we give you all the glory for all that you've done in our lives. You have been so very good to us. I love you today, dear Jesus. And I thank you, thank you, thank you for all things. Pray that you'll again, dear Jesus, be with us as we go into this evening tonight. And Lord, thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And so I will see you back here in the morning for... Um, Let's see, your morning tomorrow is Thursday. My, I'm a day off, so um, I will see you on Thursday morning. So have a good night, everybody.